All right. So yeah, not the most technologically advanced person. So when I managed to mess up the four button clicker, you've been warned. Um, so I'm Jilly. And I'm Mike. Uh, and this is Choose Your Own Misery, the Google Talk. We like colons. They make things seem much more official. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things we sort of thought we would talk about today, um, writing a book, it's sort of a solo situation most of the time. And one of the things that's kind of interesting about us is that we're writing as a team. Not very many people do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've been writing comedy as a team for like four years. Yeah, I think it has been uh, that long. I got my start off at The Onion, uh, America's Finest News Source. I was an editorial intern, and I wrote for them for a few years um, before I decided that I wanted to have my own try at doing this, but doing a Canadian version. I'm, in fact, from Toronto, it's much Canada. Much more polite. You're from Toronto? OK, cool. <laughs> So what I did was, the first thing I had to do was incorporate a company and then recruit some writers. I found uh, Jilly's work on a website called McSweeney's Internet Tendencies, and she wrote some extremely funny stuff. So I reached out to her with an email, and I said, would you like to write for us? And uh, luckily, she obliged. Yes, I saw he sent an email. I was about to get on a plane, and uh, it was the magic words at the very end. These were, this was 2011. It was back in my writing for exposure days. Mm -hmm. And it was the magic words, we pay our writers. And I was like, I don't know who this person is. I don't know what your, your you know, satire news is. Never heard of you, but I'm so there. <laughs> so I signed on, um, and we started doing this satire news site. And perhaps because I uh, have particularly apparent OCD. I was one of the early uh, enthusiastic contributors to the website. Um, yeah, we had a, a lot of great writers that have sort of written for you know various platforms and various magazines. We had thought back in the day that we could actually make a go out of it with just ad impressions alone. I think the the CPM, so the clicks per thousand, were somewhere near ten dollars or whatever. And I thought that we were going to be rich. That would be a great Perfect. source Perfect of revenue idea. for this media empire. Uh, unfortunately. Some people sort of fell off as you know, other jobs uh, took part and other projects came up. But Joey and I really plowed through. Um, yep. And uh, yeah, we were, here are some articles, actually, that uh, Jilly wrote for the SMU. Yeah, so you have to remember, it was a simpler time when our Donald Trump was named Michelle Bachman. And you know, it was, it was our best efforts here. Also, Alan Thicke, uh, anybody who disagrees with me that he is Canada's best celebrity, we're going to have to throw down because <laughs> he is an absolute favorite of mine. And we did a whole series of articles, or well, I did a whole series of articles, and browbeat Mike into letting me run them, um, which were increasing obsession with Alan Thicke. I believe we sort of ended that series on her in the bushes outside the home, the cops, you know. We Every week that. she would write about Alan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were having a party up in Toronto, and we actually reached out to Alan Thick's people in the hopes that he'd come and grace us with a few words. Unfortunately, we couldn't uh, make that happen. We couldn't <laughs> swing it, but you can swing Alan Thick. This is a really fun takeaway. You can hire Alan Thick to just hang out with you uh, for a fee, reasonably, a reasonably affordable fee, all things considered. I mean, Growing Pains was legit. So. So as the editor of this publication, um, I would often get 10 to 15 different headlines. Here are some finished headlines that we did publish. And I would sift through them, and I would look for what I would th uh, think would be sort of the funniest uh, joke that could be fleshed out into an article. Oftentimes, a lot of the writers were American, so we'd have to sort of just switch up a few pronouns or what have you to make it a little more Canadian-centric. I think Julie got a pretty good education in Canadian politics by the time that we were finished. And Canadian spelling. Yeah, and putting the U in color and stuff like that, of course. Uh, but we wanted to hit on you know, politics, have some evergreen ideas, as you can see with scientists weaponized maternal disappointment. And then we had a bunch of op-eds as well. Um, but sort of one of the things that was really interesting that you learn really quickly, doing comedy, I would say, more than any kind of writing. It's, it's a cliche to say that you face a lot of rejection when you write. Um, Obviously, you face a lot of rejection when you write. But when you write comedy, there is, you, like, no one wants to see how a hot dog is made, but if you could see the kinds of things that we reject for the SMU, they're, out of those 10 or 15 headlines that I would send in every week, the other 20 writers would be sending in every week, each writer might get one or two. And that's us. We weren't, we weren't the onion. <laughs> they might have 100 headlines, and they would pick one that they actually write up. So we sort of learned early on, uh, as a team doing the SMU, that one of the things that you have to be willing to do in comedy is let go and have your ego not be so tied up in every single joke you make, because almost certainly it is not as funny as you think it is. It is rarely as funny as you think it is. 
Yeah, exactly. I think we've always sort of worshipped at the altar of, is this funny? And if it's funny, we'll run it. And if it's not, then we just put our ego aside and move on to the, sort of the next joke. So uh, working on the SMU, it quickly became clear that myself and one other writer were, <laughs> were more enthusiastic about the you got paid for your work experience than others. Um, and you know, over the first couple of months, it was just that. But at some point, Mike reached out. And he said, would you be interested in doing other things as well? You're enthusiastic. You're writing good articles. I, he and his um, co-founder, Paul Metcalf, said, would you guys want to write something else? So we did. We, myself and Paul Hausman, who this book is dedicated to, you should ask him about the frog in a blender joke. It's terrible. <laughs> it's never been funny. Um, we started writing other things in addition to this, this mew. So that was going on in the background, but we started these are. These are some really charming photos of me in some of the sketches we wrote. Mm -hmm. um, as the only girl in this group of, of comedy writers, I got to sort of sub in whenever there was a female thing. I don't even know what I'm doing in the right-hand side. <laughs> I don't know why I'm wearing that. But you know, we had lighting, so it seemed really official. I exactly. felt really special. Yeah, we started off with sort of like a vignette of uh, short videos that we put up on the website. And the idea was. Not telling you where those live. Yeah, exactly. The idea was to make each video around 30 seconds, you know, conceive of an idea, execute it on film, and put it up on the website. And that was a lot of fun. And then I guess from there, we progressed into writing scripts. Um, I had a, a connection with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation where I could pitch some ideas. So uh, we started to uh, just toss around ideas. Some from our own lives, some just you know very funny premises for shows. Yeah. And what was the first thing that we came up with? I think the first thing we came up with was it was called Wallbridge Preparatory. I think this one was mine, um, which was it was somewhere between like the children in The Shining and <laughs> you know uh, some well, like deserted island, but a prep school. It was weird. It was a very strange idea that I thought was. Comic gold. Like everyone was going to get this. These weirdo children in their weirdo prep school, and you know they're kind of murderous. And it, understandably, uh, Mike went in with that one, and they said, "This isn't very broad. <laughs> this is this is a little specific. Probably you're not going to get much of an audience." So we tried to get more broad. Uh, I think the closest we got was probably Victory Cafe. Yeah, that was uh, a cafe uh, wherein a few people had gone to in the afternoon and a zombie apocalypse broke out. And, like it does. Uh, yeah, the only refuge within the city was in this cafe. But of course, they wanted to resume normal cafe life. So they'd often leave the cafe to go outside looking for coffee beans, come back, and then make their mochas or what have you. Like, why live in a world without a really awesome latte, I think was kind of, I think that was yeah. the tagline we came up with. So their bunker was this cafe that they had to defend against all zombies at all costs. Also, unsurprisingly, not broad enough. Yeah. <laughs> not broad <laughs> enough comedy there. So eventually, um, people sort of got a, a little worn out. We wrote like four or five different pilots. We tried to come up with these scripts. We'd try to come up with sketches. I would go up to Toronto. Paul would go up to Toronto. We'd try to film them. Um, but people have real lives. And mm -hmm. working sort of for free is, um, it's hard to keep the enthusiasm up on that when you keep getting told no. So it sort of tapered off eventually, and it winnowed down, I would say, to Mike and myself. We sort of, maybe we were just completely stubborn or stupid, but we said we will continue to do this. Um, but we did <laughs> give up first and get some office jobs. Yeah, uh, one of the benefits of the SMU was that it did get me a job at uh, the sort of largest newspaper chain in Canada called Post Media. Sort of. Where I uh, got to write a lot of humor and a lot of comedy as a columnist. Uh, you can see me there working away. I think, I don't know what I'm doing there, maybe writing about a soccer game or yeah, what have you. Watching soccer, basically, is what you're doing. <laughs> but after um, writing within these sort of confines uh, for a, a large audience at Post Media, um, wherein you, know, you couldn't really say everything that you wanted to say, often I would come home and I'd jump on Skype and I would then talk with Jilly about the next idea that we want to work on. So we were you know, continuing to work on scripts. Lots of times we were writing you know, op-eds for Xanier publications and just editing it back Tributing and forth. Tributing jokes to The Onion. Yeah, writing know? for The Onion as well. So we were in this habit. We would, we would get together at least a few times a week on Skype, because um, Mike is based in Toronto. I'm based here in Boston. So everything was done over the internet. We met over the internet. The internet is, is for real friendships. Um, <laughs> and once we had taken these office jobs, one of the themes that quickly emerged was uh, how ill-suited we were for these office jobs and how 
unhappy we were in this, not because the office jobs were bad, they were, they were fine, they were decent jobs, but we weren't doing what was making us passionate. We weren't going to work every day and writing comedy for eight hours, we were going and doing somebody else's work mm -hmm. and somebody else's passion, and it was draining, and we are uh, misanthropic people. <laughs> and it made us want to write something that was totally our own, um, and perhaps influenced what was Mike's idea uh, at the time. We would throw each other ideas all the time. And Mike came in with a few, I came in with a few, and the one that stood out was this idea of Choose Your Own Misery, The Office Adventure, which you can sort of yeah. your, explain your initial. Sure, I think we were uh, on Skype chatting. I had three ideas, and the first two were just terrible. And Julie was like, ugh, there's no way we're touching either of these ideas. And then the third idea I had was a book about a guy trying to get through one day in an office. But whatever choice he takes, whatever route he goes down, he either gets rerouted back to the beginning, uh, much in the same way you do in real life, or you get fired, or you get workers' comp, or something. You can't win. You can't win the day. Uh, and then you Julie, we were really happy in our lives at this moment, right? Yeah, yeah. Julie jumped on it, and she's like, oh, that's a great idea. We should totally write this up. I wasn't terribly certain about the idea, so I gave it to her. I yeah. said, you run with this idea. If you like it, you should do it. But she did coax me into. Yeah, he's like, it's probably not, you know, it's probably nothing, so you take it. Yeah, sort exactly. Sort of like when you're a kid in elementary school, and you're like, this tastes gross, you try it. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was how the book started. Yeah. This tastes gross. <laughs> So I guess when we got started with the book, I got a very interesting job offer to go to East Africa to work for a company called Journals for Human Rights. Uh, so I was based in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. We continued to write the book, but of course there was more challenges that were in the way. Um, one of them being just internet access. I'd have to go to uh, the shop and get an internet stick and stick it in, and I'd be sending Joey all these emails, and it'd take you know two or three minutes to load up a single page. It's like AOL, circa exactly like early days of bad. AOL. And I would say, you know, is this a funny idea? Should this character take this choice or take that choice? Julia would respond back, how about neither choice? What about yeah. this? You, usually, so we would have these email chains, and the, the delay on the emails could be several minutes at a time. It was like living in a horrible world from 10 years ago. And you, the vast majority of the emails are like, no, that's not funny. Nope, that's not good. Mm -hmm. Oh, that is pretty funny, but like, no, we're not doing it anyway. Um, so. I would say while Mike was in Tanzania, the progress was fairly slow. Um, and then luckily he came back and we could do things on Skype and things could move a little more quickly. But what we threw up here, um, one before, of the most difficult things was the organizing of this. Yeah, before I got back to uh, Canada in Tanzania, we didn't have a singular document to store all of this information that you're looking at right now. So what I did was I had posted notes and I would be posting everything in my bedroom but the humidity is such that they wouldn't actually stick, so everything would always fall to the ground. So my roommates would come in, and they'd see me frantically trying to stick everything back up to the wall, being like, oh, it doesn't fit here. It looked like a scene out of The Beautiful Mind or something like that. But uh, sure enough, Julie came up with this solution, uh, a piece of software called Gliffy. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with them. I think it's used primarily by engineers. But yeah. uh, we started to plot everything down here. Well, yeah, I mean, basically what had happened is we had been doing this back and forth. And so, uh, you know, choose your own adventure books, you have different choices, and for us, we would try to go down different threads one at a time. This is where you start, and we will say we, we went to the right, so we're going to keep going to the right until we get to the end of this storyline. Um, but it quickly became really difficult to know where we still had the, like open ends, where we needed to go next. Um, you can see it's kind of a complicated system that we ended up with. We wanted things to route back into each other. We wanted things to... There was just all kinds of things we were hoping to do with this book organizationally, and it was not possible to keep doing this by emails and a document where we're like, I think this goes here. So I searched for free flowchart software, and magically one existed, and it worked really well. So this is probably like the ugliest. It's probably making engineers cringe. It's just like boxes and like lines, but it worked really well for us to help organize our thoughts. Um, if you just look at the chart right now, actually, the boxes kind of do tell a story yeah, uh, within themselves. It, if you look at all the red boxes, those are boxes where in the book you get fired or you know, you're on workers' comp or what have you. Just it ends. terrible Your story ending. Yeah, ends. exactly. And then if you look at the green boxes, that's where you get rerouted back to the beginning and you have to start again, a la sort of Groundhog Day, if you will. Um, this, yeah. of course, provided uh, a lot of headaches in that consistency and continuity were paramount to this project because if you have something that happens at the very top, you have to make sure that you incorporate that detail into the very bottom regardless of all the other previous choices you made. 
while that's difficult, it also proved very interesting for writing jokes because we could also you know, incorporate a lot of meta jokes into the book by saying basically, regardless of what you choose, you're gonna end up in the same spot at the end of the day. Yeah, well, and the other interesting thing is, you know, in a choose your own adventure book, I might always start by going left or whatever. So I think I've introduced a character here. Great. We've all met Debbie. You know, everyone knows Debbie. We can move on. Well, not true. Not everybody chooses the way I choose, believe it or not. I'm always shocked by that fact, but it's the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to find ways to reintroduce scenarios that doesn't seem redundant, um, but does give you enough information to grab onto because it's the same office no matter where you go. It's the same coworkers, the same meetings. You know, all of that stuff has to stay fixed. Those are sort of like Whovian thing. Those are fixed points in time, and everything else we can fudge around it. Um, so yeah, and we thought one of the things that we really enjoyed was the meta joke of the routing back to the beginning. If you have had any, I don't know why you would have had time in the last five minutes to read the first pages of our book, mm. but you start out hungover, so at the end we get you drunk, and then it starts again. Like that is one of the things that we think is exactly. I don't know. Probably we think it's funny. Made us laugh. Is. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's all a long way to say that we finally came up with a behemoth that we could call our own um, and went through the sort of, I mean, it's, it's not particularly interesting standard process of finding, finding someone to put this book out into the world um, and then as quickly as we possibly could, we quit our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> so that we, you know, why not? Right, so we could focus on uh, hopefully, you know, doing a few more of these books. Yes, so there's, that there's is a couple it. more coming. So the book is out, I guess the next slide. <sighs> Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's that's it. We we nailed it. Exactly. It's, the book exists. The rest is gravy. You're pumped. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we did as well as in this photo. Uh, so yeah, at this point, we wanted to give you a little taste of the book. We wanted to do a short reading, and I'm not sure. I'm assuming most people have heard of or encountered a choose your own adventure book. But if you have not, the concept of a choose your own adventure book is um, essentially like a non-linear book even Cloud Atlas, even crazy, everything is happening in different times, you turn from page 9 to 10, and then to 11, and you read forward. In a Choose Your Own Adventure book, you read a chapter, we call them nodes, they're almost more like moments than full chapters. And at the end of that moment, you're presented with two choices, and whichever thing you choose is where you will go next, um, you know, foregoing this other mysterious option, or if you're like me, you would cheat and you would try to find out all the options beforehand. But much like life, what you choose affects the rest of your experience. So, so yeah, with that being said, with all these choices, we're gonna have to uh, put things to a vote here for this interactive reading. So just uh, for a little warm up, can I get hear you guys uh, clap and sort of hoot and holler? Yay! Great, perfect. <laughs> so if, if I read out a choice, and that's the choice you want, if you could just clap and hoot and holler, and we'll sort of just base it upon sound. But Mike will read both choices, so you know exactly. what options you actually have. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm going to take you to the very beginning of the book, and I'm sort of just going to synthesize the very first uh, node. We want to warm you up on the voting. <laughs> exactly. So you sort of you wake up, you're hungover, uh, stage five hangover, you know, you're feeling quite terrible. You think you're in a pool of what hopefully is your own urine, you hear the alarm clock blaring. You have to get up. It's time to go to work. So you've got two options here. The first Typical option Wednesday. is you can hit the alarm clock and get a little more sleep. Or the second option is you can just call in sick. So if you want to hit the alarm clock, can you give a little clap? The snooze button. Yeah. Great. And if you want to call in sick, clap. All right. So we're calling in sick. We're calling in sick. I think is happening. Yeah. So. In fact, going into work at all today is not an option. You fumble on your nightstand for your phone. No one should be in the office for at least two hours. You know it's a cop out, and it'll probably make your manager ask questions tomorrow, but right now, the idea of actually speaking to a real person is impossible to wrap your shattered head around. By tomorrow, you'll have a good enough answer for her. You tap in the office number. Hello? Shit, no one was supposed to answer. Uh, who's this? What do you want? The fog of your brain clears momentarily. You recognize this creaking, wavery voice. It's Betsy, the ancient receptionist, who apparently sleeps under her desk. Sorry, I didn't expect anyone would be in at this hour. I was just calling because I've been up all night sick, and I, I really don't think you don't have any sick days left, she says. Well, uh, just use one of my vacation days then, please. You've already used nine out of your 10 vacation days. I understand that, but I'm too ill, and it's March. 
Okay, so from here we've got two options. The first option is that you can use your last vacation day and call in sick, or you could backtrack and go into the office. So if you guys want to use your last vacation day, let's hear a round of applause. Okay. Going in. <laughs> into the breach, I think. And if you want to go back into the office, little clap. All right. All right. Yeah, I really do need to save that for, you can't think of any reason that you'll actually need the day except a hangover worse than this one, which you can't actually bear to imagine. Later, I'll be in soon. You look over at the clock and realize that because of your attempt to play hooky, you're now running seriously late. There's no time for a shower. You're just going to have to use that ax hanging out of the back of the bathroom medicine cabinet. How do you even inherit that? And hope that your sweat doesn't smell too much like vodka. You grab cleanish looking clothes off the floor and put them on the can of anarchy for him scented axe and starts spraying the entire six foot radius around you. But nothing happens. Even you can smell the clammy processed alcohol scent creeping out of your pores. You're even later. Frantic, you dig through the cupboard under the bathroom sink for anything, something, to cover the smell of your shame. You come up with a mostly empty bottle of your ex-roommate's perfume and a can of Glade air freshener. <laughs> the air freshener somehow seems like the better choice. Your roommate was a hippie. Spraying a massive cloud, you twirl through it and run out the door to catch a cab. Okay, so this is one of these situations where you actually don't have a choice and we just route you directly to another scenario. Tough luck, you made your decisions already, people. Now you're going, <laughs> you're going in the cab. You call the cab. You anxiously pace the sidewalk in front of your house. Jesus, the cab's never coming. Maybe you should call the dispatcher again? Finally it arrives and it smells terrible. Like shit that's been cooked up in BO, then been eaten and then shat out again. You feel your stomach churn. <laughs> cab driver speeds away from your house, racing to the red light at the end of the block, and then abruptly hits the brakes. The tires screech in protest. Motherfucking idiot drivers can't make it through a single cocksucking light, he mutters under his breath. This is, really, this is a G-rated reading, guys. <laughs> Somehow it makes the cab smell worse. You feel your stomach fly into your mouth. The entire ride is agonizing, filled with hard stops and jumping starts. Finally, you arrive outside your office. As you reach for your wallet, the car jolts forward again. Oh, Jesus, here it comes. <laughs> You've puked all over your shoes. <laughs> you can't stop puking all over your shoes. You need to catch your breath. Has anyone ever died from hangover puking too much? <laughs> you think you feel a blood vessel in your eye burst. A long string of saliva dribbles down from your mouth and hits your knees. Get the fuck out, shit stain, driver screams. You reach for your wallet, hoping to find a massive, mysterious wad of cash. Get the fuck out! You run out of the cab, trying to ignore the squelching sound your shoes are making, because it might turn your stomach again. You can wash your shoes when you get upstairs. It'll be fine. Just get into the elevator, and just before the doors close, a delicate hand shoots between them. Your crush, Alex, walks into the elevator. It's clear from the affronted look on her face that she has smelled your shoes. <laughs> Okay, so here you've got two options. Uh, the first option is if you want to blame the puke on somebody else, <laughs> you can turn uh, to this note. The other option is if you want to pretend that nothing has happened at all. Normal. <laughs> Just Wednesday. You can do that. So if you want to blame the puke on somebody else, round of applause. And if you just want to play it off cool as though nothing has happened. I don't know. Maybe the second one. All right. Okay. Nothing's, nothing's, nothing's wrong here, guys. We're good. <laughs> By the time you reach your floor, both you and Alex are doing your best not to gag audibly. You'll just have to wait another few weeks before you work up the courage to ask her out. It'll be fine. This will be a funny story you two share someday, right? You head to the bathroom, rinse out your shoes with an expertise born of tragic experience, and head back to your desk. Though you detest almost everything about your company and your job, there's something comforting about your cubicle. It's home to your favorite break room mug, your ergonomic computer wrist supports, your trusty laptop, which is where exactly? Well, shit. It takes you all of a millisecond to realize you forgot it at home. You stare at your empty desk mutely, face contorted in horror. It's even more galling since you knew you weren't actually going to really dig in on that presentation you were supposed to give today. Have you ever once worked from home? But even if it's just a prop on the conference room table, you can't do the presentation without the laptop. It'll be too obvious that you're bullshitting with you when you don't have it there. If memory serves, Debatable, considering your current state, the laptop is on your kitchen table, exactly where you left it when you walked through the door last night. So I think this is probably the last Yeah, last this would be the last choice. Make. So we really want to hear you guys uh, clap here. So if you want to go and grab a loaner computer for the day, 
that will be one option. The other option is if you just want to go run and uh, go home and grab your computer from there. So for the first option, if you want to grab the loaner computer, can we hear a round of applause? Great. And if you want to go home and grab your proper computer, let's hear a round of applause. OK, so loaner computer it is. Loaner it is. You head to the IT department. As always, the first thing you notice is the smell. Soup and breathe right strips. You try to breathe through your mouth. Any chance I can get a loaner for the day? You ask the nearest IT guy. It's slim pickings. We've got a Samsung, but it doesn't have Office on it, he replies, never taking his eyes off the fanfic site he's reading. I kind of need Office. I mean, doesn't every PC ever made have Office? No. I also have a MacBook Air, but a few of the keys don't work, he says. Which ones? The E, Enter, Numbers, and the Spacebar. <laughs> All right, taking the Samsung. The IT guy, is it Brian, Andy? You should really know his name by now. Reaches for the Samsung. Be careful not to unplug it. It will instantly shut off the power if the power supply cuts out, he says. There's nothing to say to that, so you walk away. You see your boss walking down the hallway in the opposite direction. Looking forward to that <laughs> big presentation, he says as he passes you. Get your hopes up, you say with a forced laugh. Hopefully it was convincing enough to mask your anxiety and fear, seeing as the presentation isn't finished or even started. OK, and I guess we'll leave it there on a cliffhanger. Yeah. Ooh, <laughs> you can only find out in the actual office adventure what might happen next. Um, so, so I think that's thank the you. talk, yeah. Yeah, and if people have, this is, this is the question hour now, so please <laughs> ask us anything or just something. It can be personal. It can be about Mike's renditions of O Canada. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for talking and the book. I'm really excited to read it. Awesome. Thank awesome. you so much thank for you. listening. Uh, I, I have a kind of a logistical question about the creation of the book. How did you decide where to put the different sections, like where it says jump to page six, how did you decide to put page six and not page, you know, like halfway through the book? Well, that's actually, it's interesting. So when we started, we had, um, we had that document and we were writing them as separate nodes, everything we would label on the flow chart. So 1A, 2A, B, 3A, B, C, D, et cetera, going down. Um, and when we wrote it up, we put those in order and linked like a Word doc hyperlink to go through it. And then we gave it to our printers and our publishers, and they magically made that into real pages. Yeah, exactly. So the, the short answer to that question is, I don't know. We, <laughs> we just put them in order and then hoped for the best. Um, they probably futzed with it a little bit. But the thing that happens with those, and you, you see it really quickly once you start going through them, at the beginning of the adventures, they're all page two or three, page four or five are the next options. And then it starts skipping quite a lot because there's just too many other things in between that you haven't chosen. So it feels like a mysterious experience, hopefully, where you don't know what's coming. Um, and I would encourage you to occasionally flip through the book with no goal whatsoever and see what you can find. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So how, how do you proofread a thing like this? <laughs> So what we do is we uh, collaborate on the ideas, and then we will go our separate ways and write. You know, I'll write up my parts. Jillie will write up her parts. Then we'll meet again, uh, you know, via Skype, and we'll go over each line basically, and we'll go over it. Is this funny? Is this pushing the action forward? Uh, so just like a line by line edit, I guess. But then beyond that, once we have the book in hand and you have it mostly set up, it is extremely involved. And we had to create multiple versions of that chart that we went through and just changed everything to, you know, blacked out every one that we'd gone through. So you have to start at the beginning every time and go through the entire way. And then you have to start from the beginning again and go through and at the very last moment turn right instead of left. It is a long, long, long process. You inevitably miss things. Our editor, um, Laura Duane, was phenomenal on that. She went through and she's like, I don't think you introduced Debbie in this thread. And we're like, nope, we didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she caught a lot of that for us. But this will be like a fun Easter egg, like find the mistakes, because they're almost certainly still in there. It is, it is really hard to make sure that every single way you do it, everything has been, to, been introduced specifically in that thread. Um, because someone will go down that thread very first and find out that we, we didn't do it right. So it was very, very long. I used to proofread professionally, though, so I've got that good OCDI. Hopefully, we caught most of it. 
I was wondering if you could say anything about uh, writing as a comedy partnership, like any sort of ground rules or secret success or differences in your sense of humor? Yeah, well, I, I think as I mentioned before, you sort of don't want to be precious about your ideas. You should be yeah. willing to just discard an idea whenever. I think the goal has always been to create the strongest piece of content. So whether it be writing headlines for The SMU or The Onion or writing these videos, um, we always just say, you know, is this the funniest thing that we can come up with? If not, give me an alternative. Yeah, I think the first, the very first rule is that you have to be willing to abandon most of your own ideas. Like you have to assume that your ideas are not going to be the best that anybody comes up with, and you can't get worked up about that. It can't be personal, um, which is hard. It was a little bit easier right, to start with four people because out of four, the chances are good that yours isn't everybody's favorite every time, but it doesn't feel as personal. So by the time it was just Mike and me, we were really used to the idea of like me saying, like, that's not funny, <laughs> and vice versa. Um, but yeah, generally what, what you try to do, we'll fight for ideas that we want to keep um, and say, let me explain why it is, in fact, really funny. But if it's, not, if it's not working, like Mike said, the very first thing you sort of say is, OK, that's fine. It's not funny. It's not working. What do you suggest instead? And you just have to keep throwing ideas against the wall until something sounds right to both of you. And then maybe someone else will tell you it's not funny, and then you have to can it again and start over. So. It, it, it helps a lot in that we read our work out to one another as mm -hmm. we edit and rewrite, because you can see you know, on the person's face via Skype, or you'll get a laugh as to whether or not this is funny. When you're writing stuff by yourself you know, in a room, you might think it's funny. But you know, if you don't have anybody to bounce the ideas off, you're a little bit uncertain. I think, broadly speaking, I like my comedy sort of dry, yep. and Jilly sort of likes her comedy maybe a little more zany. Yep. And we often meet in the middle. So she's got this X voice, I've got this Y voice. And when we put it together, you create this sort of Z voice, in a sense. Z. Oh my gosh, you're so Are Canadian. <laughs> yeah, we, we create a Z voice. Um, but yeah, it's, it's reading out, I think, is the other, the other secret tri trick that they tell all authors to do that and that you feel ridiculous and you don't read your work in front of a mirror, but it's amazing what you hear that you wouldn't see when you're reading it in your head. Um, and the rhythm of comedy makes a huge difference. A joke can land or fail just based on like one extra word. And when you're reading it out, you can suddenly hear like, oh, I went on way too long here, like gone. So I hope that answered your question. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hello. Hi. I have a son in college, a freshman in college who's been writing to their satirical paper. Great. So I was wondering awesome. how do you land an internship in The Onion and what that experience is like? Sure. Uh, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> I did a, a master's degree over at the London School of Economics, and I chose to write my dissertation on the political relevance of satirical news. So in doing that process, I contacted people at uh, Colbert, John Stewart. Uh, this hour has 22 minutes for the Alberta and the audience, as well as The Onion. And the Onion were enthused with the project. Uh, once I'd got my research and done all the interviews, I went back to them and I said, you know, I'm not sure, but I've got some jokes. Would you be willing to read them? And that sort of progressed into a conversation about doing an uh, internship in New York, uh, which was six months at the time, unpaid. I, I, I jumped on it. I thought that it was a great offer. And then I suppose toward the end of that, uh, they had a bunch of interns. There's a sort of competition for a few writing slots. And you submit jokes. Each week, I think you submit something like 15 jokes. Um, and uh, from there, you know, they'll pick one or two people. And I was fortunate enough to get a contributing position, which I had for two years. And then they let me go. And then they rehired me again. Um, and I brought Julian on board, of course. But I would say just you know, reach out. Um, if you want to talk to somebody about the potential of getting a job, I think interviewing that person beforehand is a great way to go about it. It's like a sneak attack. Exactly. <laughs> Interview them about what they do. Although the other thing that is probably useful if, you're, if your son, you said your son, is a freshman, um, keep doing it for a couple years before you're going after that slot, because he's going to get so much better. Your jokes are going to get so much better the more you do. And they might not think you're ready now, but two years from now, when you've done this for that much longer and you've had the conversations we have with each other about this, this wasn't working and this is why, what you submit to them is going to be so much stronger um, and you have a, a, probably a better shot of getting your foot in the door. Yeah, of course. But like, throw, try everything. Go and to it, the internet <laughs> right, like for random websites, do everything, and then you'll get better. <laughs> Great. Perfect. So first, thanks for talking to us today. Um, it seems you've chosen to continue to work in the choose your own adventure form. I'm actually curious, 
why you decided to do more of it. It's not that it's bad, it's <laughs> just that it could have been, that was a great, funny idea, now let's do something else. Well, we are in a very fortunate position, actually. We, we wrote this book, and we had the idea, and we had it all done up. And when our agent told us that she had sold it, she said, and they want a three-book deal. <laughs> and that is, listen, that is mana from heaven. So we said, that's awesome. Um, and we, we always had tons of ideas. We always saw that there could be a ton of, there's a lot of misery that you can hit on. Uh, and so, you know, the holidays for us was like such an obvious next choice. So when they said that, we said, perfect. We know what we will do next. Um, and we were hoping, still are hoping, that that will help us, you know, get a little bit established so that the next time we do a project, people have heard of us and they're excited for it. Yeah, exactly. I think we always thought from early days, OK, we could transpose this format onto another subject. There's a ton of fodder out there. We thought of Choose Your Own Misery, the maternity leave, Choose Your Own Misery, you know, the online dating adventure. Um, and so you know, the ideas that we could sort of put this on are almost endless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, now we've figured out how to do it, and we'll have one more crack at it. <laughs> we've already written the holiday book, so hopefully we'll get better and better. <laughs> OK, well, good luck, and thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Um, I was just wondering if you guys could talk a little bit more about, um, you mentioned like you weren't together, right? Most of this was over the internet. Right. So just how you think that both benefit, benefited or made it more difficult to write and um, kind of your experience with a digital uh, relationship. A completely digital relationship. It's so funny because Mike and I, this is probably like the fourth time we've hung out in person, fifth yeah. time. Like everything was done over the internet. One thing I would say, I think, Having most of our conversations through Skype as opposed to in person, it is a nice, a little bit of a barrier. So when you talk about like that being able to give up your ego with jokes and give up your work really easily, I think maybe it's not something I would consciously have said before, but maybe that made it a bit easier to let go of stuff because you're still in your own space. Your space is still yours. And there's that little bit of a barrier between you that makes it slightly less difficult to say, OK, fine, we'll move on. We'll do the next thing. Um, yeah, when we started writing scripts, there's a, a few more people that were writing with us. And we actually used Google Hangouts uh, for the most part. And that was always thank great. You. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you guys, exactly. You, seriously, like, we kind of exist because of Google, so thanks. <laughs> yeah, the idea that you could sort of teleconference with uh, four or five people and whoever is sort of talking the loudest would be the most prominent in the screen was such a, a great idea for this collaborative process. And it got us all to talk louder, which was fantastic, <laughs> too. But uh, yeah, no, I agree with Jilly. It does sort of create this, um, th this, this barrier that you, know, you can pause and you can do your own thing. You can make a cup of coffee without having to worry about entertaining the person in the room and then jump back on the call and get to it again. Yeah, which is nice. or you can duck out and weep. And <laughs> yeah. then you're like, no, I'm cool. Let's keep <laughs> moving. You know, It's normal stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have a situation where you know you're alone, you're doing your thing, getting ready, and uh, and you just you know this is so funny, you're laughing, you can't stop, you know water's coming out of your nose, the whole thing, you know, and then you share it when your next Skype, and they're like, nah, that's not funny. I mean, how do you deal with that kind of thing? You know, you know it's really funny. Duck out of frame, you weep. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, absolutely. I think we have probably both had stuff where you're like, this is this is so it. This is the thing that is going to make every joke come together and the other person is like, I'm not feeling that. Like, I don't, I don't see where you're going with this. Yeah, I, I think we've been working together long enough that we really trust each other. And if Jilly finds something really funny, I'll trust that the joke is funny as well. Maybe I'll try to add or augment it here or there so that we can sort of shape it up a little bit. But if she comes to me and is very enthousi enthusiastic about an idea more times than not, uh, we'll run with it and vice versa. Right, and I think the other thing, the other thing we will sometimes do is I think I said before, we, we had a, a joke that we were like water out the nose into. Um, you fight for it. If the other person is like, I don't get it. You, you try to explain yourself. You try to fight for it. And one of the things we'll sometimes do is say, can we leave it in place for now and come back to it tomorrow and see if you processed it so that the person who maybe brought it in can feel a little bit less close to it. And the person who didn't bring it in can turn it over in their head and see if they feel the same way. Um, so that has helped, the, the ability to turn off the computer screen, vent to your you know, significant other or my cats, and you know, come back later it makes it a little bit easier to do that. But sometimes you just have to let go of things that you love, that you thought were great, um, and maybe they weren't great for what we were doing together now. So mm -hmm. 
We're, we're like very zen. We've learned how to get rid of all ego. <laughs> <laughs> so since no one else is asking, I'll, I'll ask another question. Um, are there, are there, do you think of uh, humor as there being like genres of humor? Like for example, I have friends who won't watch Curb Your Enthusiasm because it's cringe humor and it's yep. just too painful for them to watch, you know, and others just can't get enough of it. And you know, there's the stand-up stuff and then, you know, onion kind of humor and stuff. Are there genres? And if so, where do you see yourselves? Well, we're definitely in the dark humor <clears throat> spectrum. Uh, definitely <laughs> towards that end where, um, I think, I think both of us see humor as a really important way to deal with difficult things, like a catharsis, the catharsis element of humor, uh, which t sort of pushes you towards darker topics a lot of the time. You can't laugh, if you can't laugh about it, you'll cry about it topics. Um, so we're definitely on the dark side. I'd say we're definitely on the dry side. It's a bit of a British vibe sometimes I think so. to our I think humor. That's what people on Amazon have been saying. Yeah. yeah, they're like these Brits. I'm like that's <laughs> not. We're actually I think shelved or like one of the drop downs on Amazon is British humor. I'm like great. I think that's, it's that's British that's and fantastic. Irish. Yeah, British humor. and yeah, Irish yeah. humor. Um, so now you know. Which really pisses you off. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah, he's he's annoyed. I'm like awesome. They have such great accents. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'd say we're we're wry. We definitely also, I, I think we've both said this before, it works better as written humor. It, a lot of it, seeing it and thinking it over, some of that like subtle um, wit or wryness or whatever is easier in that form. Perhaps maybe we're just not good enough performers for it, but it's, that kind of humor I think plays better on the page than it maybe does in person, whereas a little bit more over the topness in stand-up humor, no matter how dark it is, works better there. Um, so probably rye, a little bit understated, and uh, very dark. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and just in, in the, the few pages you read, I didn't hear a lot of Dilbert in your office humor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope that's not a disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> You've delved into some video before, and um, I was wondering if there are any moments in your video chats that you would think might make a good, uh, a good thing to share with the internet. <laughs> Yeah, I mean... Well, lately what we've been doing, um, I have a Skype recorder, so when we do our Skype sessions, I'll record the entire thing, and then I'll go back and skim over it, um, and my face is in the corner here, and Jilly's face is the predominant Huge. one. So <laughs> I'll look, and every time that she's laughing, I'll stop you know, the frame and see what we're talking about, and then uh, you know, I'll cut that in, uh, I guess, iMovie or something like that. And then I'll export the MP4 into Facebook. Right now, Facebook seems like they're pretty crazy on getting sort of raw video uploaded. So I'll upload that onto Facebook, put that on our page, and then we've got a YouTube channel, a yep. Choose Your Own Misery YouTube channel. Oh. Heck yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we'll put that on there as well, and, you know, tweet it out and put it on our Google Plus profile. And right now, it's, it's mostly like that sort of behind the scenes moments because when we're talking, we crack each other up a lot. Sometimes it's not something that we feel comfortable sharing with the internet at large, like what's making us laugh so hard. Yeah. But often it is, and so we'll take those little 15 second moments, and that's, uh, that is our YouTube channel at the moment, is a lot of us, and then a couple videos that were um, us doing very erudite readings yeah. uh, that we put up there as well for people. So not a lot of views yet, please, by all means, yeah. like bump up those views on the YouTube channel. I'll just, I'll just say April 1st is a few months away, and you could always script one, too. You're right. Yeah, you yeah, have yeah. a very good point. Mm -hmm. Thank, thanks for having us. It was great. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.